I'm kind of a newcomer to the topic of human enhancement, uh, uh, but I've done a lot of work over the years on virtue ethics, and so you know, part of my, my brief, I suppose, today is to try to bring those two fields together. Uh, and so it's a relatively short talk, but essentially uh, it's also going to be drawing on a lesser known writing of Bernard Williams, just as Julian uh, had been doing. Um, but essentially what I'm going to be focusing on is uh, a distinction between personal integrity and professional integrity. And I'm interested in cases where people seem to speak up, you know, whether they be lawyers or doctors, seem to speak up on grounds of professional integrity uh, and say something or do something that seems to maybe you know, go against the efficient organisation of an institution. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit more specifically about human enhancement now because as you can see in the title, it's about utilitarian um, enhancement. Um, but I'm focusing also, of course, on the question of moral enhancement. So here's an outline of my argument. Um, so utilitarians uh, may suggest and you know, some do suggest that when people, when the sort of people that I described before, who have feel kind of morally compromised by having to do something which seems to streamline the overall organisation, uh, that maybe they ought to just take a pill, uh, use pharmaceutical means of enhancing themselves to try to better enable the efficient sort of running of the organisation. And the kind of organisations I have in mind here are things like the adversarial system of justice uh, is one that I'm going to talk about um, and the role of lawyers there. But I also want to talk about the impact that certain pay for performance uh, kind of healthcare mechanisms can have on the doctor's role and the doctor-patient relationship. And what we ought to do if we're trying to enhance there, should the enhancement focus on trying to improve that relationship and the virtues that partly constitute it, or rather, should the enhancement uh, try to focus on the overall running of the organisation, the overall running of the institution um, itself. So I'm going to give you a couple of cases where you have to you know, perhaps choose one or the other. Um, <clears throat> and it seems to me that a lot here, this is, this is what I'll be arguing, a lot here really depends on whether we understand these refusals or the feelings of being compromised uh, as appeals to personal integrity and one's own individual conscience, or whether we understand them instead as someone saying, I cannot with my doctor's hat on do that for you. Cannot with my lawyer's hat on do that for you. Or in other words, as appealing to the proper goals of the profession. And so I'm going to be talking about the latter kind of interpretation and argue that, that this way of looking at those feelings of being kind of morally compromised helps show why we should reject the use of pharmaceutical and for that matter other means of assuaging practitioners' moral unease about or feelings of alienation towards their roles in various cases. But I do want to say a little bit in passing, pretty much, about the way that you might be able to bolster certain virtues, an example I've got is courage, uh, through pharmaceutical means. So I'm not totally opposed to it, uh, at least in my first, um, first foray in thinking about these issues. Uh, so, as we know and have been hearing today, Ingmar Persson and Gillian Savalescu have argued for the use of various pharmaceuticals like oxytocin and antidepressants to morally enhance things like altruism and also people's willingness to justly cooperate with other people. But in an earlier article that they wrote, they also argued for these and other forms of enhancement as a sort of necessary check on the possible excesses and risks of things like cognitive enhancement. So this helps really direct me to the territory I'm planning to focus on, which is about the questions of integrity, because you might ask, or you might say, that without better developed moral consciences, we might risk bringing about you know, great harm, such as nuclear war, which is, the, which is the case that Julian and Ingmar focus on. So let me uh, then move a bit more, more closely to my topic by uh, talking about perhaps a famous quote from Montaigne, uh, where he argued that if we take conscience too seriously, that can be an obstacle to the achievement of important social goods. So he said in his essay of the useful and the honourable, in every government there are necessary offices which are not only abject but also vicious, 
Vices find their place in it and are employed for sowing our society together as are poisons for the preservation of our health. If they become excusable in as much as we need them and the common necessity effaces their true quality, we still must let this part be played by the more vigorous and less fearful citizens who sacrifice their honour and their conscience as those ancients sacrificed their life for the good of their country. We who are weaker, let us take roles that are both easier and less hazardous. The public welfare requires that a man betray and lie and massacre. Let us resign this commission to more obedient and suppler people. Um, some of you would have heard that sort of uh, heard that quote before, or certainly be familiar with those kind of sentiments. But to me, it's got a lot in common, uh, although it's not completely the same as the kind of critique of utilitarianism that Bernard Williams put forward, where he argued that uh, if we take on a job, amongst other things, that would be contrary to our deepest convictions, our personal integrity, uh, that this is a problem for utilitarianism, um, where that's the only way of maximising utility. So thinking about these kinds of cases, two somewhat different cases that have got a lot in common, it's interesting to think about what would count as sort of moral enhancement here. Let's talk about sort of bioenhancements more specifically and perhaps pharmaceuticals. It seems to me that Montaigne would welcome the availability of moral bioenhancements here to help perhaps the more suppler and, uh, or the people who um, have you know, problems at stepping into these roles that are very useful. Uh, you would think he would be in favour of there being a greater sort of percentage of the population who are able to do this, maybe through the use of various kinds of drugs. And you would think also that perhaps if there was an integrity suppressing pharmaceutical or other similar bioenhancement uh, that was available, that that might be something that utilitarians would welcome also. <clears throat> but um, this is where I wanted to draw on, as I mentioned, the lesser known article of Bernard Williams. He has another article, Professional Morality and Its Dispositions, where he gives a somewhat similar argument to his well-known sort of critique of utilitarianism. Um, and it seems to me that there's an important point in that argument, uh, but I want to draw it out and extend it a little bit more in the context of perhaps talking about moral bioenhancement. Because I guess the argument I want to put is that contrary to Montaigne and some utilitarians, instead of pharmaceutically enhancing people so that they become capable of taking on these necessary offices that Montaigne talked about, we should start questioning whether there might actually be something amiss with the roles themselves, and that this is a way of gauging it through looking at the reactions of the individuals who have to actually occupy those roles. So the argument that Williams gives in that article, Professional Morality and Its Dispositions, is about the adversarial system um, in legal practice. And essentially he argues that if a system like this leads to widespread feelings of alienation, for example, by criminal defence lawyers, then this is an important indicator or indication to us that something's going wrong with that system. The system itself might be um, a fairly efficient way of administering justice, but if the practitioners themselves can't actually occupy those roles or fulfil those roles well without feeling alienated from what they have to do in their professional capacity, what their legal self has to do, what sort of tactics they're expected to provide for a client, in particular the sort of cross-examination that they're not only sometimes expected by clients to provide, but also find themselves a bit kind of, I suppose, caught up in. Um, and so from William's point of view, this sort of feeling of alienation from one's roles, if it's the only way that a criminal defence lawyer can actually manage being in that role and fulfilling its goals, that that is too high a moral price to pay for having an efficient adversarial system of justice. He also argues that concentrating now on lawyers, one can see quite a few reasons why some conflict, qualms and moral unease might be usefully encouraged or perhaps merely left by a legal education. An education that properly allows for such things will straightforwardly encourage lawyers to question the reality of what they are doing and to ask whether certain practices that cause suffering or in at least, in at least an extra legal sense, injustice, are actually necessary. <clears throat> 
So I think the point that Williams is making there is clear enough. Um, but what I think he misses out and what I think might help us to work out what to do in regard to perhaps pharmaceutical enhancements um, you know, for sort of moral reasons is to draw a distinction here between personal integrity and professional integrity. And in particular, appeals to personal integrity and conscientious objection are kind of the bane of legal ethicists because often they will say that if you've got all these lawyers just appealing to their own personal values of who they like, who they find to be a repugnant client, and so on, that's going to subvert the legal rights of clients. And so we need um, lawyers who clients can rely on uh, to actually help the clients uphold their legal rights. So, you know, that's a concern that I share, and that's uh, maybe a criticism that you could make of Williams so far. But I think if instead what a lawyer is appealing to is the proper goals of the profession rather than their own personal likes and dislikes and personal values. So if instead they appeal to what I call professional integrity, then I think it's, it's harder to um, draw that conclusion to say that this is sort of all things considered unjustifiable. <laughs> So let me just say a little bit about that distinction then. Um, and I guess the, the example of a legal ethicist I have in mind is Tim Dead, a New Zealand philosopher here who wrote um, a book called The Council of Rogues, uh, question mark. And um, as part of that book, I mean, the whole point of the book is to try to develop a principal defense of the adversarial system, and, um, which he does very well in a lot of ways. But I don't think that he addresses this concern about lawyers' refusals to provide certain services or to adopt certain tactics that are requested by, by clients um, where the lawyer's reasons for saying no are because it would be sort of contrary to justice in some sense. So contrary to, the, if you like, the proper goals of the legal profession. So Tim um, certainly has this concern and he's written about this in a number of places that uh, the problem with a virtue ethics approach to legal ethics is that it, in his view, seems, it seems to license individual lawyers subverting the rights of clients by individual lawyers just appealing to you know, their own personal values, ordinary virtues. This is also an interesting issue that Kant addresses, actually, in his short essay, What is Enlightenment? So Kant has this example of a pastor there who's preaching a sermon, and the pastor has misgivings about the official teachings of the church, and Kant sort of addresses what the pastor should do if he's to be an ethical pastor. Um, and Kant's answer, which you know, Tim is quite keen on as well, is to say, well, look, you're there, you've got a job to do, there are, if you like, expectations, legitimate expectations that, that you know, your congregation have, that you will be you know, preaching the official teachings of the church and not departing from them terribly. But if you've got serious misgivings about it, what you should do is, behind the scenes, agitate to try to get them changed, which might be a very kind of long process. But that's really the extent um, to which you're allowed to go to in terms of trying to, in, you know, in terms of expressing the concerns that you might have about um, what those teachings are. So Tim's view is similar to that. Um, so I was actually in this talk not going to say a lot about the limits of personal integrity. I just wanted to try to remain agnostic about that because my main argument is that when a practitioner acts from professional integrity, uh, and so when their concern is that the service, the tactics, um, if you like, the type of role uh, is something that is contrary to the proper goals of the profession, that that is a very different reason for saying no to a client or a patient than to say, um, well, I have these personal values and uh, you know, I feel compromised by it for these personal reasons. Uh, so then it seems to me going beyond Williams that when role alienation stems from professional integrity, that should be regarded as an important signal that something is amiss with the institutional role itself. And so contrary to Montaigne and some utilitarians, uh, a practitioner in this situation shouldn't simply take a pill and get on with it. This is the kind of example that I mentioned before. I cannot, I don't know if you can read that, I, I cannot as a lawyer do that. I, I probably cannot if you're sitting at the back of the room even read that. But um, 
So I'll just read a little bit of that to you. It won't read it all. Um, so the, the kind of perspective that I'm coming from here is to really develop accounts of role differentiated virtues, uh, say in the context of legal practice, which is something I've done before, but here I wanted to try to build on that and sort of give you two parallel examples of uh, a lawyer and uh, a doctor saying no um, uh, to patients or clients on grounds of professional integrity. So suppose, to take an example, perhaps for medical practice uh, now, that we think about doctors who refuse to provide a few dollar intervention mm -hmm. to a patient where that's requested by the patient's family. You know, again, the doctor mightn't have any personal misgivings about doing that, but the doctor can, I think at least, can say, you know, perfectly legitimately to the family and the patient, I cannot with my doctors how I do that for you. It's not the brief that I've been given by the community to do this. Um, so, um, so this, if you like, is an internal critique of roles but it's not one that relies on the personal values of the practitioner. It's rather just what they see the role or the hat of representing. And so now I want to talk about a case uh, from the criminal uh, law, a case that some of you would know I've talked about a fair bit over the years, but it's one that I find fascinating. So I'm really fascinated by this phenomenon of post-retirement shame. Um, always on the lookout for books of people. When they retire, people get very candid. They want to get things off their chest. They write their memoirs, say stuff about their role they wouldn't have said while they're in it. And you know, for me, what's powerful about those accounts is it's not me, some ethicist, saying you did the wrong thing in your role. It's them saying, look, I went too far. I realise that now. And I found a few examples like this in medical practice and legal practice. This is still the best one that I've uh, been able to find. And um, it's, by, uh, it's from a 1981 book by a guy called Seymour Wishman, who uh, wrote this bit of a potboiler of a, a book. He was a very successful New York criminal defence lawyer uh, who had, uh, and he writes about this on page one of the book, was confronted when he went into hospital to visit a client. He was confronted by this large African-American woman who was a nurse at the hospital. Started swearing at him, wanting to attack him, wanting to strangle him and so on. She had to be restrained by the orderlies. And um, on page two of the book, he's then wandering down the hospital corridor to see his client, thinking, who the hell was that woman? What, what was going on? And then he realises that she was the complainant in a particularly vicious um, trial, a sexual assault trial, that he was involved in the previous year, uh, where he was able to get his client acquitted. So he realises, he thinks that, oh, OK, so my client was guilty. Now, I'm not saying that you cannot ethically defend a client who you have some reason to believe is guilty, um, but if you, um, you know, it's a very fine line there, so I'm not passing judgment on that. I'm more telling you about his own reaction to it, which was that um, that incident triggered the whole of soul searching that goes on throughout the rest of the book about when it was he went too far in his role, because what he thinks about that case was that the sort of tactics he used to basically humiliate her in the witness box uh, was going too far. So this is what he, he had to say about it, and I'm going to quote in the middle of that slide. So this Lewis woman I had humiliated in the sodomy rape case had changed things for me. A bell had rung for me. Her outrage and pain after the trial had made a joke out of my posturing and my claims that there was nothing personal in what I'd done. The Grotam well was something personal. If she'd been telling the truth, I'd stripped her of what little dignity she had left after my client had finished with her. Maybe I hadn't done anything unethical, legally unethical. Uh, in fact, I might have been doing what I as a lawyer was required to do, but preserving our criminal justice system, worthy as that goal might be, was becoming far too narrow and abstract a concept to you know, to provide me with any comfort, I had ignored the larger moral and emotional implications of my actions. What I love about that quote is that um, it shows that as a lawyer, it's very easy to come up with a justification for going ahead with the really zealous tactics. Um, you know, lawyers are not short of justifications for you know, what they do it's in the context of um, the area that he was working in criminal defence. But it's more 
what he came to see about how far he had gone and how kind of caught up in the role he became. So um, for me, what he is saying there is not necessarily appealing to personal integrity. He may or may not be. But he seems to me pretty clearly to be appealing to professional integrity and saying that what he did in the case of this particular woman was contrary to the goals of justice, which is you know, what lawyers should ultimately be trying to serve. So in this sort of case, now coming back to... Um, I've got this other example here. Um, yeah, I'll just say it briefly, just so you can see that the point is generalizable. And then I want to come back to ask this question, or try to finish off with this question of what people in this sort of situation ought to do in regard to sort of morally enhancing themselves. Um, you know, should if they could try to overcome any mis any such misgivings while they're in their role through perhaps pharmaceutical means, ought they to do that? Or ought they to instead uh, perhaps you know, try to resist such temptations and perhaps help all of the community in being a kind of whistleblower in, the, in a sense about the profession or helping us see about, um, see, understand more about how easy it is to get caught up in one's role and sort of where to draw the line. So this is a different example and this is one of doctors and it's one from the UK where they've got what they call the Quality and Outcomes Framework. Um, and a number of doctors over there have reported in the literature um, that because there are these, because of the way the financial targets for clinics are set up, uh, whereby the clinics get a monthly reward if they hit certain targets for things like prescribing statins or say the number of pap smears that that clinic has provided, that some doctors have felt actually morally compromised at having to either prescribe statins or carry out, you know, like pap smear um, tests for like cervical cancer screening in cases where it was completely not medically indicated, so to speak. However, you, you might think, well, there's good institutional reasons for us to have a really solid evidence base here. And if we've tried other means of getting doctors to do this, and the only way we can get them to do it is through in the introduction of financial incentives, again, you've got a dilemma, which way do you go on that? Um, so in that kind of scenario, again, you might have the question, well, which values ought to prevail? If the, if the doctors who are feeling morally compromised are saying, I cannot act on the medical virtues of things like medical beneficence here, or even worse, if my having to prescribe statins or you know, carry out these uh, tests uh, in cases <coughs> where it's not actually medically indicated, redefines a relationship from being a therapeutic relationship into something else, then again, you can say, well, so which way should we go? Should the goal here be the preservation of a therapeutic relationship and thereby the medical virtues um, of the doctor, or rather should the goal be the overall in, um, goal of the institution to have a better evidence base um, for these conditions? So that's uh, what I wanted to address. So I realise it's gonna go a little bit longer because there's one further issue I wanted to raise. But on that question, um, you know, this is where I think that we shouldn't be using uh, perhaps pharmaceuticals in order to quell the doubts. We shouldn't adopt the Montaigne approach uh, and say, well, we just need to find the right people to fill the jobs, the ones who are not going to have the qualms, not going to feel morally compromised. Um, but rather, I think that there's a value in having people like that, being able to speak up, whether it's Seymour Wishman about going too far, in what he did for his client, or um, you know whether it's some of the UK doctors feeling sort of morally compromised with individual patients, that there's a value in their being able to do that, um, rather than you know taking a drug to help them just ignore the doubts that they have. However, um, I did want to say something about how you could, as a virtue ethicist, maybe. Uh, at least except in some cases, some sort of pharmaceutical enhancement. But at least one example that I thought of was beta blockers being used by a whistleblower who's expressing the virtue of courage uh, by perhaps giving evidence at a government inquiry against, let's say, an incompetent surgeon. You know, for me, if the way the whistleblower is using the beta blockers to calm their nerves to be able to give really accurate you know, testimony here, um, I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, I don't know, maybe such a person would count as a little less courageous 
if they were to use beta blockers to speak out, but they'd still be pretty courageous. Pretty clearly though, there's gonna be a point where if you keep doing that, um, then you might say it's really just Dutch courage. Uh, it's not real courage, it's Dutch courage that they're displaying. Um, something, and this is not um, a, a project for this paper, but maybe you know, a worthwhile project for someone to do would be to try to look at when um, people can actually build their virtues through these pharmaceutical means. And so you know, Mark Alfano has a book, 2013 book, Character as Moral Fiction, where he has a whole lot of points, one of which is pretty familiar to us, uh, about where if you attribute more global virtues to people, like being trustworthy, then they'll start to live up to that. So they have a kind of instrumental value. And it might be that some of the moral bioenhancement literature you know, could usefully link up with that to say, well, even if someone's taking beta blockers or something a little bit stronger um, is going to undermine their claim, <clears throat> their claim to courage somewhat, if it helps them become more courageous, then you know, maybe it's a worthwhile thing to do. You might even argue, as Julia Annis put well in these scenarios, that we shouldn't just reserve the term right action for when they have perfected it, but rather when they're taking the initial steps towards right action, showing a little bit of courage, uh, the, that, that can count as right as, as well. Don't know if you want to go down that path. Um, so I think I've just got a couple of slides left. Um, so one concern uh, that's recently come out in the literature as a sort of backlash against applying virtue ethics, especially in healthcare, is to say, hey, hang on a minute, all this, you know, all you guys out there teaching medical students to you know, be more courageous and have these virtues and so on, the hospitals love you guys because they don't have to worry so much anymore about adverse events and so on because they can just rely on this whole army of whistleblowers, especially if the whistleblowers have now got you know, beta blockers and so on, coming forward and just reporting it. So it can sort of um, lead to a kind of institutional complacency here is, is the worry. This is me extending an argument um, in an article in the May-June issue of the Hastings Centre report, Must We Be Courageous? by Anne Hamrick, John Ara and Margaret Mormon. So I, don't, I can see the worry there. Um, so they speculate when courage is excessively or inappropriately valorised, oppressive conditions, unresponsive systems, bullying clinicians, job insecurity and the like may be tolerated, not only as unalterable, but even as acceptable because they nurture desirable practices of courage. To me, that's going too far. Um, and second last slide is, um, I, I don't think that virtue, I don't think that actually the promotion of virtue need lead to institutional complacency. Um, and I think a good way of understanding perhaps the value of courage here is by analogy with compassion. Think of it as um, saying, if we, in the case of compassion, say, well, okay, this is a virtue, this is a valuable attribute, but surely we can appreciate the value of compassion uh, and compassionate healthcare practitioners um, with, you know, without then thinking that distressing circumstances ought to be created in order to promote compassion. Um, rather, we can think of compassion as having a conditional value, that you know, if there is suffering there, people, especially those who are likely to confront it a lot, ought to be able to deal with that well. So, um, and so I don't think that um, we need to say, oh, it's you know, going to lead to this institutional complacency, but look, maybe in the end it's just an empirical question. Um, so, finally, um, moving to where this could go, which is about sort of policy applications of virtue ethics. Um, and this is probably a, a bit of a, um, a more subtle point and one I shouldn't be ending with, but I will end with it and see if there's any questions about it. And it's really just to say that I, the kind of obligations that I see states as having here is to try to support practitioners, whether they be lawyers or doctors, from not only having the sorts of relationships with clients and patients that they're expected to, so in the doctor case, of course, therapeutic relationship, but in the very having of therapeutic relationships, they are displaying medical virtues, at the very least the virtue of medical beneficence, so that when governments provide doctors with this sort of legal environment and climate whereby doctors, which help um, doctors maintain therapeutic relationships with patients,
states are thereby supporting medical virtues uh, by doctors. So, um, and I think a similar point can be made about the legal profession. So, um, I'm happy to elaborate on that. That last step was probably a bit too quick, but I've already been talking for half an hour, I think. So, I'd better stop there so there's a few time, a bit of time for questions. Thanks very much. judge said, oh, I, mean, I just can't do this job unless I'm feeling drunk, then you'd be horrified. Mm -hmm. and, and you sort of, presumably your, your view is that there, there are these professional virtues that come apart from competency in some way. Or perhaps, well, I'm not sure what your view is. Yeah, that. well. So can you say a bit more about yeah, that sure. distinction anyway? Sure, yeah. Um, I wasn't sure about the professional virtues coming apart from competency, but. Um, well, but where competency is having a virtue. Yeah, yeah, I see. Well, to address what you said at the, the start of the question was how much how much value do I think the professional virtues should have, which is something I could answer. Um, and so, I, I suppose when it comes to thinking about role virtues for professionals, I think that the kind of value they get is because they enable a practitioner to serve the proper goals of the profession. So, for me, it's dependent on how much value those goals that, you know, themselves have. Um, there might be areas where we might, there might be occupations where we might say, well, okay, there's been these sort of traditional occupational goals, but maybe there's character traits help you serve them, but you know, really the goals don't matter that much. So in turn, perhaps the virtues or you know, character traits wouldn't matter that much. Does that, does that help a little bit? Or? I think so. I suppose there might be subsets of the, subsets of the profession, certain roles within the profession where the virtues are less important. Uh, oh, I see. Like I'd probably try to, I personally would probably be, you know, I think of other virtues there. That that's so. It's a pretty broad category, I think, when it comes to professional roles. But it has to have something to do, I think, with dispositions and character traits. So. Steve. Um, yeah, with the uh, lawyer who was uh, you put on the horns of the dilemma, they <laughs> um, had qualms about having to defend dodgy clients, and well, one thing to do about it is enhance their. Uh, moral emotions so that they overcome these qualms, and the other is to become uh, whistleblowers and uh, sort of speak out against the system. Um, it stressed my I wasn't quite convinced that this was a, this was a genuine dilemma. I mean, uh, can't you do both? Can't I uh, drug myself up, defend the client, and also say, look, this system is so bad that look what I'm having to do to uh, participate. Yeah, um, so I suppose I've talked about two different ways you might use drugs here, you know, so one would be to kind of, you know, quell the qualms, you know, that you could have, the unease. So in the Wishman case, one use of them might be that we just, um, you know, say he didn't, he didn't have to wait until he retired to realise that he went too far, but say he had the inklings of it at the time when he was mm. actually representing his client in the case involving this woman. So, oh, okay, so... Um, and there are drugs available to him to, to quell the doubts he might have. You know, that's when I'd say, well, no, he shouldn't be taking those drugs. At I'm that still not seeing why he can't do both. Why can't mm. he take the drugs and also write down what his problems are, send an anonymous letter to the newspaper or something? Oh, okay. Well, if he, I'm um, understanding taking the drugs as then you know, doing what the drugs enable you to do, which is going too far, you know, in the sort of cross-examination tactics that he used. But I guess, yeah, is that what you mean? Well, <coughs> surely you could do that and also point out what he's done. I mean, you seem to be assuming that taking the drugs means he's now going to lack reflective capacity to, uh, to uh, examine what he's done. Oh, I see what you mean, yeah. I suppose the concern I had with him taking the drugs was what he then might do and that I guess a lot of us might be equipped to judge, including him, that he's gone too far. So yeah, I mean, perhaps 
Mm. He could take the drugs, use the humiliating sort of cross-examination tactics, and then you know write a letter and reflect on it afterwards. Yeah, he could do that, but then. I don't think that would be a good use of the drugs in a way, because I think he shouldn't be doing that sort of thing and he shouldn't be using those tactics in the first place. Okay. I'll leave it there because I think we must have questions. Kirsten? Yeah, I think one of the problems that the enhancement doesn't really affect is that I think the fundamental problem here is not so much that the person is conflicted or even you know his professional integrity, but that his profession um, requires two incommensurable goals. And no amount of human amount enhancement is going to resolve that paradox for him that he on the one hand, and this is the same in the medical case. So if you have two goals or two roles that you have to bring in line, which just don't go together, that is do the best for your individual patient, and do the best for the community, which is sort of represented in the court. And if these two goals conflict, no amount of human enhancement can solve that problem. Yeah. So um, I think in the medical case, it's maybe a little bit different. To, that there's a, maybe an important difference with the medical examples I gave compared to this one, in that um, with the medical examples, you might think that uh, you know doctors. I don't know about sort of carrying out unnecessary pap smears, but you know, doctors have these broader professional obligations to help the health department collect good data or to, for example, notify them about um, a notifiable disease. And that's the patient's not happy about it, but that's just what you have to do. So there's that sort of problem. And to me, I think it's clear of what a doctor should do. They should, they've got these broader obligations which are overriding and broader virtues. But in this sort of case, seemed a little bit different because it seemed like he was saying, you know, this is the last thing I should be doing as a lawyer. It's not to use these tactics in, you know, cross-examining this woman. So so you could maybe try and, one way of going, one way I could maybe go is to say, you know, down the track, analyse the post-retirement shame and see what it is they're ashamed of. And, were, you know, were they ashamed that just, you know, not being absolutist in the sort of obligations they had to this patient or to this client, or were they more ashamed that, of what they did to you know, someone else, like what he's talking about? So it's sort of betraying the overarching goal um, of the profession. I don't think they're different at all, because what, what you have, this lawyer had an obligation to his client to do the best he could do. He had, as such, you know, legal or legal moral or whatever you would want to call it, obligation to the woman to not humiliate her. Mm -hmm. And you have the same thing with the medical or the you know, medical professional who has an obligation to a particular patient, but also an obligation to a whole community of patients. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you have an obligation not to waste scarce resources like, for example, blood products. Mm, mm. Yet you know that this one patient might survive an extra three weeks if you give them a unit of blood. Mm. And, you know, in the scope of the whole community, gaining an extra three weeks mightn't be justifiable in terms of the obligation that you have to preserve precious products. So you just have conflicting obligations, and I think that's more the problem rather than... Mm. I, I keep relying on this, I cannot with my doctors how I do that for you idea, or cannot with my lawyers how I do that for you, and to me that is saying this is completely contrary to the proper goals of the profession then, so yeah, but I'll, but I'll think about that some more, it's a good question. I'm afraid we have to leave it there, so thank you very much. Justin. Yeah, thanks very much for your questions.